Stepping Out is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. With a continued passion for public television, we are proud to underwrite Stepping Out. Please join us in supporting WIES television. The New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation promotes, preserves, and perpetuates music, culture, and heritage through programs, cultural, educational, and economic activities year-round. Learn more at jazzandheritage.org. The American Italian Cultural Center and Museum on South Peters in New Orleans offers event venue space, Italian language classes, dual citizenship and translation services, seminars, genealogy, and trips to Italy. Ciao! AmericanItalianCulturalCenter.com this program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Board and welcome to Stepping Out with updates from the local restaurant, arts, and entertainment scenes. Joining me, what a show! <laughs> Poppy Tooker, host of Louisiana Eats on WWNO Radio. Howdy! Hello, Peggy. Hi. <laughs> Making her Stepping Out debut, Libby Neidenbach. Hello. Hi, Peggy. Interpretive training coordinator at the Historic New Orleans Collection and curator for the brand new exhibit. Yet she is advancing New Orleans women and the right to vote. 1878 to 1970. Welcome, dear. Hello. Thank you. Good to see you. Alan Smason, editor of the Crescent City Jewish News and theatercriticism.com. Howdy, hey. dear Alan. And speaking of, he's back, Michael <laughs> O'Hara, four time Grammy nominee, singer, composer. The list is long. Michael performs for us tonight, and we get to catch up with his latest activities. Hey, Michael. Hello, Peggy. So Hello, everybody. Here. Hello. Poppy, Poppy, lots of restaurant and food news, huh? Well, such, we're gonna start at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum, where there is such an interesting new exhibit. I was so fortunate to get to know this young woman named Abigail Rode Pasina. Now, she is a New Orleans native, and everybody's got a connection to everybody here. Her dad is Ralph Pasina, who, of course, is the director of culinary operations at Creole Comps. Everybody knows her mom, Glenda, from <laughs> Cafe Reconcile. But there is that beautiful oh. young woman who is a Mount Carmel native, and she was captivated by her Middle Eastern roots. And she's just come home from getting a master's in London, studying the languages, studying the culture. She lived in Jordan. She volunteered for uh, an organization there called Bet City, which means Grandma's House. And she has just put together an exhibit after spending months and months doing interviews locally all about the Syrian Lebanese American kitchen. And it's exploring the cultural connections through food. It's so fascinating. We've got pictures where you can see all of the important spots that existed here in New Orleans, like Abu Grocery. Many of these names will be familiar to people, but it, it's so interesting, because I don't remember growing up surrounded with Lebanese culture the way, you know, we've got the Sicilians, we've got all these other influences here. It seems like when they moved here in the 1800s, when they first immigrated, these peoples were very concerned about how they would be identified. Mm. And so they wanted to make sure that they were classified as white people. Mm -hmm. And that is why they kept, according to Abby, so much of this culture in the home, so close at hand. Well, it is a rich, delicious culture. You can learn 
all about the deliciousness mm. at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. But speaking of culture, there's a super terrific cultural experience that's going to be happening for the first time at Miss Rivers. Of course, that's Elan Shia's spot in the Four Seasons, and they're hosting the inaugural Crescendo Dinner on mm. June the 21st. So. Get your tickets, because this is going to sell out quickly. It's an immersive five-course tasting and listening experience with Alan Shia pairing dishes with musical selections performed by young artists of Preservation Hall. Mm. That is going to be mm. so interesting. And then I've kept my mouth shut about it long enough. It's <laughs> time to tell everybody Go to Mason Herford's latest sensation, Hungry Eyes. And of course, Mason, he's such an interesting person. And his longtime friend and the chef at Turkey and the Wolf, Chef Phil Senak, has joined him as a partner with Mason's wife, Lauren Agudo. And the, the menu is very approachable. It's a lot about cocktails. The, the menu items range from $2.50 to $20. But this emphasis on cocktails, look at that. There look is that. that is a green pandan old fashioned, and it's got rum and bourbon in it. Ooh. And look how green Ooh. it is. <laughs> but of course, they also have classic martinis and all sorts of very interesting things to drink and eat. Now, they open at 4 o'clock every day. And people have been worried about the line and waiting. But don't worry if there is a little line, because you can wait in air conditioning right next door at Second Vine Wine. And there's a great wine list also, aside from the cocktails at Hungry Eyes. So we've got some fabulous dishes, smoky eggplant dip, the artichokes on the half shell you've heard so much about, veal sweetbreads with peanuts and puffed rice, gulf shrimp, but of course, this is Mason's restaurant. So of course we're gonna have grilled grilled pastrami with a red wine barbecue <laughs> marinade. So no phone, no Woo. website, no reservations. Oh, oh that's Just handy. Go. <laughs> okay. Just go. And trust me, you're gonna have a blast. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hungry Eyes. Interesting uh. Uh, title there. Libby, oh, it must have been so fascinating to work on this exhibit. And I know it's in conjunction with a, another exhibit that we'll talk about later with Smithsonian. But to, uh, to profile, to focus on these women who were very brave to stand up for the vote. And it, uh, it, it seems like it's, it's so long ago, but it really wasn't. No, not at all. And we have some footage of the exhibit. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So, you know, 1920 uh, is when the 19th Amendment was passed, and that's kind of seen as the crowning achievement for a decades-long struggle of women across the nation to, you know, be included as part of the democratic process. Um, and I argue in the exhibition that both black and white women here in New Orleans did play a significant role in the women's suffrage movement. But also in New Orleans, the story for women's um, fight for the right to vote does not end in 1920. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the federal amendment does give all women the right to vote, but Louisiana laws continue to disenfranchise black women. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, exhibition kind of covers almost a century of activism of both by black and white women. Um, you know, from 1878 to 1920 is the first section that's gonna give you the real, you know, on the ground local story of the women's suffrage movement. And then we have a middle section of 1920 to 1950 that looks at kind of this uh, different uh, trajectories for white women and black women during that interwar period where white women are kind of slow to go to the polls and then they start after the 1930s really getting more and more um, politically active, whereas black women are still just trying to, uh, you know, access the ballot as their right as American citizens. So they're doing things like paying their poll tax, even though mm. they weren't going to actually get to vote. Mm. Um, and then the last section is 1950 to 1970, and this is going to be uh, mostly around the modern civil rights movement, but you start to see black women uh, mobilizing their, you know, organizing massive voter registration drives. You have women like Dr. Katie E. Wickham, who founded the Metropolitan Women's Voters League in 1955. This is a black women's voters league. They're you know, canvassing, they're help, trying to help um, black New Orleanians register to vote. Um, and they're, uh, in these schools, they're running these um, voter education schools 
to help people navigate the really complicated registration form. Mm. And these schools are actually found all over the city in barber shops and beauty schools. Um, Katie Wickham actually owned a beauty school on Dryads. Mm. Um, and so it ends in 1970, and that's really because uh, that is the year that Louisiana actually finally formally ratified the 19th Amendment. <laughs> oh, I know. And it, it, it was like, it was yesterday, but it seems like yes. uh, much longer ago. I love the fact that women like Martha Gilmore Robinson, who is such, uh, you know, an important part of preserving the quarter. Oh, okay, yes. But in, involved with, I saw a, a photo of Sharon Brilsky, who's still around. Yes. Okay. Sharon's you on know, the intro uh, panel. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, you know, and so many others who were fighting the good fight. And, uh, it's a lot of work, but um, very much giving their due. Huh? Definitely. And with Martha Gilmore Robinson, yes, she was a big uh, historic preservationist, but she also founded the Women's Citizens Union in 1934, which becomes the League of Women Voters of New Orleans, wow. which is, of course, still around today. And you've got the today. IWO, the Independent IWO Women's is in there, definitely. You know, the League, or the Council of Jewish Women. National it Council just, of Jewish Women. It's mm -hmm. amazing yep. how many activists. Yeah. So a lot of national uh, presidents of the National Council of Jewish Women yes. came from New Orleans. They did. Yeah. And and they were all very active uh, in suffrage, like Ida Weiss' friend. Um, the name, though, so she, still she is yes, advancing. Yes, she is come, yes, she is, Where does that come from? That's a great question, Alan. It comes from a quote from Sylvania Williams in 1903. So you all know Sylvania Williams. She was an educator, principal. She also founded the Phyllis Wheatley Club, which was a mm -hmm. black club for um, women here in the city. And they were suffrage as one of their... Uh, issues that they were working on. And the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which is the big national organization, you know, Susan B. Anthony, all those big leaders, um, they had their annual convention here in New Orleans in 1903. Um, and because New Orleans is segregated, black women are not allowed to attend. And so Sylvania Williams invites Susan B. Anthony and other national leaders to talk to the Phyllis Wheatley Club. Wow. And they come and, uh, you know, Anthony does her thing. And then Sylvania Williams gives this really powerful speech and she compares women of the world to flowers, and she talks about black women kind of being like the flowers that are trodden underfoot, but yet she is advancing, and she might be further along than you expected. Ah. Great decision yes. today. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. And we move over to Michael. Michael, it's been a while. You look great. Well, We're so you. glad you're on um, with us, and uh, I know you've been keeping busy uh, uh, and doing CDs and, and keeping active and playing around town. But yes. before we do all of that, you you before, you came in a little bit earlier um, this evening and and played for us. You're going to play. Tell us the first. Well, one. I'm going to do a song uh, by Diana Ross made famous, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. <laughs> um, because uh, t speaking of strong women, uh, black and white, I've always adhered to women's rights. And uh, okay. I had four sisters and a strong mother and grandmother. <laughs> She'd say, baby, you don't need to be free unless you're free in your mind. Because, uh, <laughs> but yeah, we that's the song We loved your mom and we remember her yeah. well. Before we go to, though, we want to congratulate you on your award. Well, thank you. Yeah, Lieutenant Governor. Governor's office, huh? And so, tell us who, who are you with? Getting I am with uh, Jeff Dorson, who is the uh, director of the Huma uh, Louisiana Humane Society, of which I'm works. a spokesperson uh -huh. for. And that is also uh, the uh, manager of the Chop House, where I play on Fridays and Saturdays. Uh, which we're going to talk about yeah. in just a sec, okay. but uh, congrats. And before Thanks. we do all of that, though, let's hear Michael O'Hara playing the song. Stop me, baby. 
if you are my goal. Ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough, ain't no river wide enough to keep me from you. Ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough, ain't no river wide enough to keep me from you. Must follow the sun wherever it leads. But if you should fall short of your desires, remember life holds one guarantee. You'll never get rid of me. <laughs> and if you should miss these arms, one of these old days, then please, my darling, remember what I told you the day I set you free. Mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough, ain't no river wide enough to keep me from you. Ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough, and ain't no river wide enough to keep me from you. Ain't no mountain high enough. Saturday night? Friday and Saturday nights at the Chop House, 323 Magazine Street, 6 to 10, and I don't take a break. <laughs> <laughs> really? And valet parking. That's and such valet a deal. Park, just pull up know? and they'll park your car. You give them a tip and they'll go get it back for you. Okay. You know? <laughs> uh, and for more information, of course, you've got the Facebook page. Yes, Michael J. O'Hara on Facebook. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and Rabbit Ash Records, more information about your albums, too. And congratulations on all well, that. Well, I have a surprise. Okay. Oh, oh. Oh, okay. I brought my new CD, <laughs> which I'm paying. It's called Micah Billy. It's my first Rockabilly ah, right. album. <laughs> and so um, I'm paying homage <laughs> to the one and only Elvis Presley, oh, oh, because he mentored me when I was seven years old. And that, unfortunately, I cannot believe it's going to be a cliffhanger. We're going to have you back and tell that all whole right, story, all right. because that is an incredible story. But congratulations. Thank you very congratulations. much. Congratulations. Thank you. Moving on to Alan. All right. Well, when everybody sits down in their seats uh, in the Sanger to see Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird at the theater, they may not be familiar with two names, namely Bartlett Shear, the director, or Aaron Sorkin, the writer, but they should be, because Sorkin's work are really especially relevant with today uh, surrounding all those racism and privilege uh, questions that there are. It echoes in this new piece. This is a vehicle, however, no, nobody, nobody can say anything about it. It's a vehicle for Richard Thomas. He walks on the stage each night with, with a smile as he knows he has absolutely killed it. <laughs> the Emmy Award winner assumes the gentle father figure of Atticus Finch, much like you would a comfortable pair of old shoes. Uh, the narrator of the play is Scout, of course. She's played by Melanie Moore, who's impressive as a girl trying to uh, essentially navigate through her childhood in a racially divided 1930s Maycomb, Alabama. Atticus is chosen to defend a, a black crippled Tom Robinson who's played by Yegel T. Welsh. He's falsely accused of raping a white woman. It's pretty evident. Mayella Ewell, as portrayed by Ariana Gale Stuckey. Mayella and her father, Bob Ewell, chillingly portrayed by uh, Joey Collins, have their own reasons to see him executed. This is a capital offense, of course. Sorkin rewrote the role of Calpurnia, though. Uh, Ella 
elevating the Finch maid to serve as a spokesperson for the black community and to show how they felt about the trial and their station in life in the Deep South. She's memorably played in this uh, particular uh, production by Jacqueline Williams. Also in a small role is Mary Badham. You may remember that she played the original scout <laughs> mm. in the original film in 1962 against uh, Gregory Peck. She was then the youngest nominee for an Academy Award until, of course, Tatum O'Neill was nominated and won. <laughs> One character who's not in this picture, he's actually replaced, but I really think everybody should see is Link Dees. He's thought to be the, the town drunk. That's Jeff Still. He's a marvelous actor. I saw him in the minutes uh, on Broadway. He plays this role exceptionally well and allows Sorkin to essentially make a comment on race relations of the era. Finally, it's a story about family. Uh, it's about Scout and her brother Jim coming of age, her friendship, of course, with, with Dill. There's also an opportunity uh, to meet Arthur Boo Radley, who's uh, a mysterious next door neighbor and becomes a major factor in the tale. But this is the national tour of To Kill a Mockingbird, starring Richard Thomas. And I have to tell you, it's going to be ending its run on Sunday. It's amazing to see all the people filling the seats for a play at the Sanger, not a musical. Uh, <laughs> but it was the most successful play on Broadway. Uh, and it's easy to see why it works so well. It's well directed, well directed, and well acted. Not exactly truthful to Harper Lee, who eventually published Ghost Set a Watchman and really set out the fact that Atticus was not necessarily the hero figure that we came to revere in the movie and, and earlier in the book. But that set aside, it's a dramatic piece that plays, again, to a full house of the Sanger, and it's an endorsement, really, of how important this work is. Yes? Okay. We're going to have to zip through, but I know you wanted to mention right. the season. Let's go through okay. it real quick. Okay. Uh, the, the Sanger season starts off with a wonderful world, uh, homage to our own Louis Armstrong. Uh, you'll not want to miss that. Then, of course, MJ, the musical, the story of Michael Jackson and the Jacksons. Yeah. It's hard to believe it's been four years, Peggy, since Wicked was last here. We all remember how it was shut down due to the collapse of the Hard Rock Hotel uh, across the street there, but the COVID show... Uh, Showed down, shut down, basically prevented from showing, but it's going to be on, uh, uh, again, Wicked. Uh, Jean Valjean, Javert, Marius, Cosette, Eponine, they'll be back uh, with the band of Cutthroats, etc., with uh, Le Miserable. That'll be playing in January, following of which will be, um, uh, again, one of the best jukebox musicals of the past years that I saw was Ain't Too Proud. Uh, that's, of course, the story of the Lit Temptations. Uh, and then Annie. Hold on to your wigs after Annie. We're going to see <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire. That plays May 14th. And finally, a comedy ends the whole season with Clue, which goes from June the 18th through the 23rd for next year. And my Fair Lady's in there somewhere, too. Yeah, oh, no, you, you know, you, 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 I, 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 I should say, <laughs> My Fair Lady, I've never seen that one. It's it's going to be basically January the 9th to the 14th. All the times I had an opportunity to see it on Broadway, I never got to. So this will be an important one for me. All right. And so you've got the music uh, yeah, man uh, yes. coming Three up. Three things coming up real uh -huh. quick. Local productions. Uh, the Music Man at Summer Lyric, Rachel Looney will be taking the part of Marion Peru. AJ Allegro will be directing Twelfth Night at Dixon Hall, June 9th through the 24th. And of course, the quirky uh, <laughs> Vanya, <laughs> Sonia, Masha, and Spike returns with Crescent City Stage at Marquette Theater on the Loyola campus. And that's set uh, to start on June the 15th. Thank you so much. Time for our picks, Poppy. Don't forget, kicking off next Wednesday through Saturday, the New Orleans Wine and Food experience. All right, very good. Libby. My pick is the um, other exhibition that you mentioned, American Democracy, A Great Leap of Faith. This is a traveling exhibition from the Smithsonian. It opens at the Historic New Orleans Collection on June 17th, runs through October 6th. All right, thank you very much. Alan? A week from tomorrow night, June the 9th, here's Johnny 2. Jim Malberg portrays Johnny Carson. Paul Bello from New Orleans will be Ed McMahon. Paul uh, Peter Salter will play George Burns. And Dee Dee Hansen will be on the red carpet uh, a half an hour before the show starts, portraying none other than what? Black Jones! Rivers. <laughs> and, 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 and again, also, you mentioned Little Richard earlier, uh, mm -hmm. Michael. He, he's going to be portrayed by uh, a fellow as well, Ray Charles. So go see that as well. You'll, you'll, okay, you'll okay. probably like the show a lot. And Michael, once again, you're come Michael see, Belly, huh? Yes, and then come see me at the <laughs> okay. Chop House, Fridays Absolutely. and Saturdays, 6 Very to good. 10. Thank you. Now, my pick's the 70th Annual Symphony Book Fair. It takes place this weekend at the UNO Arena. Books, art, and even Mardi Gras memorabilia. <laughs> and from 
9 a.m. to 3 p.m. this Friday. If you pay $15, you get to be in there early to purchase some very, very special items. And there's even a first edition of Confederacy of Dunces. Can you believe that? That's <laughs> going to be a lot of fun. And um, all free admission after that. And on Sunday, 11 to 2, children can actually stuff a bag that they can decorate with books and it only costs $5. Go to lpovolunteers.org for details. WYES will present a documentary called Little Richard, the King and Queen of Rock and Roll. That's Friday <laughs> night at 9 p.m an episode of the American Master Series in New Orleans. And New Orleans is very much of a part of it. And we have a clip with uh, Deacon John. Let's take a look. The dude dropped in. Well, this was the, the hippest place to play in town. Little Richard came in here. And one time, I was his opening egg. Richard was a really flamboyant dresser with the glamorous suits and ties that he wore, with the hair up with the bouffant. It was quite popular in those days for men to wear their hair like that. So I just took it a step farther, put mine a few inches higher than everybody else. I was the only guy wearing eyelashes. I was the only man wearing makeup. You know, a lot of people thought he's some wild and crazy guy. But, you know, everybody from all walks of life came into a place like the Dewdrop. We had uh, doctors, lawyers, pimps, prostitutes, rich, poor, you know, LGBT, you name it. Okay, see you at Friday evening at, uh, of course, 9 o'clock on WYS and WYS.org and the PBS apps and the YES app, all of those good things. One more YES thing, next Tuesday, June the 6th, the National World War II Museum will present a very special screening of Marcia Cavanaugh's documentary, founded on Friendship and Freedom, the National World War II Museum. 5 o'clock reception, 6 p.m. screening. Go to WYES.org to register. And you all, thank you all so very much Thanks for watching for and us. for being with us and all that good stuff. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. And now, more of Michael. Oh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to pay homage to a lady that I, I happen to know in real life. She's no longer with us. So you know her, and I know her, as Miss Tina Turner. Rolling, rolling, rolling on a river. Yes, we're rolling, rolling, baby, rolling on a river. I left a good job in the city. A lot of gas down in New Orleans, and I never saw the south side of the city. Till I used to ride on the river boat, where big wheel keep on turning, over oh, primary keep on burning. Steppin' Out is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. With a continued passion for public television, we are proud to underwrite Steppin' Out. Please join us in supporting WYES television. The New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation promotes, preserves, and perpetuates music, culture, and heritage through programs, cultural, educational, and economic activities year-round. Learn more at jazzandheritage.org. The American Italian Cultural Center and Museum on South Peters in New Orleans offers event venue space, Italian language classes, dual citizenship and translation services, seminars, genealogy, and trips to Italy. Ciao, AmericanItalianCulturalCenter.com. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area.